So in many ways, tonight was a typical night for old Donnie. But that's why it's so troubling. Like, on the one hand, it's hilarious. I got some images, some on-the-ground reporting, some people following along digitally that noticed that this was one of Trump's most pathetic, pathetic speeches in a tiny arena that was nonetheless empty because the crowds just aren't showing up because he's a boring SOB. Nonetheless, he's not only doubling down on the, the hateful rhetoric or tripling down, he's quadrupling, quintupling down on it, got sounding even more evil than he sounded in recent weeks, recent months, even since January 6. And so we're going to, without giving Trump much airtime, we're not going to give him much airtime. I have a few clips to show you, but most of it is reporting on the event. And we're going to talk about this pathetic empty arena. That Donald Trump, as his money dwindles, as his support weakens, as prison looms, his supporters are ditching him. And rather than saying, man, maybe I need to be less of a fascist monster, and maybe if I was a better person, more people would like me. No, he's like, I have to embrace the darkness. And if I don't do that, I have no chance. Watch this, hit the like and subscribe button. It helps me out a ton. And we're going to be back because while Trump is trying to massage the arena to make it look full, and I'll show you the, the tricks he did, the schemes he did, the evil schemes. I have the one image that proves him absolutely wrong. His fascist arena is an empty one. So you can see that Donald Trump is going in and on again. And this, of course, you can't disassociate it. Look, look, far be it from me to say Ron DeSantis is right, because in many ways he's just as evil, if not more evil than Donald Trump. Another Trump rally, more attacks from former President Donald Trump on immigrants. Here he was earlier today in New Hampshire. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world, they're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Let's discuss more now with CNN senior political analyst and senior editor at The Atlantic, Ron Brownstein, and NYU history professor Ruth ben -Ghiat. She's the author of the book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present. Uh, guys, uh, thanks to both of you, uh, Ruth. I'm, I'm glad to have you back on the program. Um, let me start with you. you. You've studied fascist rhetoric, autocrats, authoritarian leaders. You and I have talked about this subject many times. Uh, what was your reaction when you heard what Trump say, uh, had to say earlier today? This is, you know, this is fascist rhetoric. Uh, the worries about polluting the blood of the superior race uh, go as a standard of Nazism. It's not just the Nazis. It's also fascists in Italy. Uh, Mussolini literally talked about killing rats to go back to Trump's use of vermin in an earlier speech. He talked about killing rats who were bringing uh, infectious diseases and communism into Italy. So, you know, this is fascist rhetoric and he's using it for a very precise purpose. But we also want to, you know, ask why he's using it now so often. And unfortunately, the Trump campaigns made it very clear what they want to do to immigrants, you know, mass deportations, mass detentions, likely abuses and violence uh, in those operations. And, you know, dehumanizing immigrants, which is what this language does, is a way to get Americans prepared now to, to accept these repressions later on. That's what's so terrible. And that's also another thing that's so fascist about this. Uh, Ron, I mean, help us look at the, the big picture here, if you can. I mean, obviously, there, there are the electoral concerns, I mean, for the Republicans. It's hard to imagine uh, swing voters in uh, places like uh, suburban Philadelphia or Michigan, Wisconsin, gravitating to this kind of language after they've already rejected it before. I mean, this is something that has hurt Trump in previous elections. Why do you suppose, as Ruth was saying, uh, he, he keeps going back to this. He's been doing this a lot lately out on the campaign trail. Yeah, well, first of all, it's great to be on with both of you. And like yeah. many people in the U.S., I've learned a lot on these issues in the last few years from uh, Professor Ben Yet. So I'm, I'm really glad to be to be here with you. Look, 
the the yeah. big picture is that the U.S. faces a situation that I believe we have not been in since arguably the two decades before the Civil War. I mean, you really have to go back, I think, to John Calhoun's dominance, the South's dominance of the Democratic Party in the 1840s and 1850s, uh, to look at the last time the dominant faction in one of our two parties was not committed to American democracy as we have understood it and practiced it uh, throughout our history. And this is an extraordinarily challenging and in many ways ominous situation for the country, whatever happens in the 2024 election. Trump has shown there is an audience in the Republican coalition in particular for all of these kinds of arguments. You know, in polls while he was president, 90 percent of Republicans said Christianity in the U.S. is under attack. Three quarters uh, said that discrimination against whites is now a bigger problem as discrimination against minorities. And in multiple polls, Jim, uh, 55 to 60 percent of Republicans said the traditional way of American life is disappearing so fast that true patriots may have to use force to preserve it. So there is an audience for this. But as you note, there is also a substantial audience uh, that has been mobilized in three consecutive elections to prevent this vision from being implemented. And, you know, we are in a position now where a majority of voters are unhappy about the economy, discontented about Biden, maybe think he's too old to run for another term. But it's a very different proposition to say that most Americans in the end will be able to will be willing to empower someone talking so explicitly, uh, as the professor said, echoing uh, fascist leaders from the darkest moments of the 20th century. I've said to you before, and I believe again, Trump throws Biden lifelines every day. Voters are unhappy with the way things are going in the country, but that doesn't mean they're willing to go in this direction either. Well, and and Ruth, I wonder, does, do you think that there's a chance that Trump understands that this doesn't really get him to 270 electoral votes, but that there is a utility in keeping his base amped up on these issues, amped up with this kind of rhetoric because of whatever, whatever else he has in store for the country? I do. I, I, I think um, he, he, you know, the Republicans are uh, like Matt, you know, Gates is talking always about how force is how we're going to bring change to Washington. Uh, they're not really thinking inside the Democratic box anymore. Uh, and he's more concerned, which he has been since 2015. He's just hugely accelerating it now with re-educating Americans to want violence, to be OK with violence. And before, you know, he managed to make uh, January 6th into a patriotic event. Now he's dehumanizing uh, targets that will be people who will be the state enemies, who are already state enemies in Trump 1.0. But now it's a whole other scale. I do want to tell your viewers that if anyone who thinks this isn't going to bother them because they're not an immigrant, he, he, they're not going to stop with immigrants. I'm quite concerned that he is mentioning um, what he calls mental institutions and prisons so often. Uh, in, an, in another speech, he actually talked about you know the need to expand psychiatric institutions to confine people. And he mentioned special prosecutor Jack Smith. Former President Donald Trump took his anti-immigration rhetoric to a shocking new level today at a rally in New Hampshire. He said that immigrants are, quote, poisoning the blood of our country using language that is often employed by white supremacists. Uh, CNN Steve Contorno joins us with more. Steve, uh, sounds like uh, some some of the stuff that we've heard from Trump before, but it was really kind of on steroids today, the way he was doubling down, tripling down and adding uh, some really insensitive layers to his usual rhetoric. What more can you tell us? Yeah, that's right, Jim. In some ways, it felt like if you had you would be forgiven if you thought you had walked into a Trump rally in 2015 and not 2023, because so many of the themes were reticent of the kind of language he was using eight years ago. And when it came to discussing uh, undocumented Americans in, in general and, and undocumented migrants, it was particularly dark and often using this language that has been adopted by by white nationalist groups and roundly criticized by civil rights leaders. And this is something we've heard more and more from him lately as he gets closer and closer to this campaign, uh, and people starting to actually vote. Take a listen to what he had to say today. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world they're coming into our 
country, from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Now, along with this rhetoric, also came some policy proposals, including a travel ban on, quote, terror plague countries, uh, ideological screening for all immigrants, and, quote, the largest deportation operation in American history. Now, a lot of these are things he said he would do when he was elected president in 2016, and he either ran into the American legal system or political uh, uh, trouble, including with some Republicans, or just sort of dropped off entirely on. And, and that is one of the criticisms that we have heard, especially from Governor Ron DeSantis. He has no problem with the rhetoric or the policies of President Trump. He has said that Trump didn't do enough uh, when he was president, he was just here a day ago in New Hampshire as well, and he was telling crowds that he would actually be uh, more effective at accomplishing the Trump agenda than Trump himself, Jim. Essie, uh, let me start with you, your reaction to Trump using uh, white supremacist uh, Klan language. I mean, there, there aren't any dog whistles here. This, this is with a bullhorn. No. The kind of language that he's using. Yeah, he's not winking or nodding. Um, like you said, um, he's he's out and proud, um, as as it were. Uh, and I think that's because um, not only is this kind of a go to for him, but his base has has condensed. It's still very loyal and rabid. We know that. But it's condensed. The folks that might have come on board, maybe a little skeptically for the first go round, for all the normal reasons, maybe economic policy, taxes, regulations, they're all gone. They're gone because they don't want the uh, the freak show and these, you know, the, these kinds of, of, of storylines that come along with Trump. So all that's really left are sort of like the conspiracy theory crowd and folks that would respond to this. And so exploiting white fright um, is, I think, something you're probably going to hear more from Trump over the next year as he's, you know, uh, running running for president again. Yeah, I mean, Molly, uh, Trump also today vowed to investigate prosecutors across the country, vowed to indemnify police officers as they crack down on crime. He called January 6 prisoners, quote, hostages again. Uh, he also predicted that Americans will flee the country in droves if he wins the upcoming election. Let's listen to that one. As soon as we win, uh, you know what's going to happen. People are going to flood out of the country. They're going to flood out before we even do anything. They're going to leave the country. What kind of a campaign uh, platform is this? <laughs> well, I think one of the things that Trump is trying to do, which he did successfully in 2015, 2016, and he has not been able to recapture, is he wants that free media, right? In 2016, he, had, he got free media by saying crazy stuff. And he'd have that, you know, it ended up being more than a billion dollars worth of free media where he'd say something crazy. Then there would be the backlash that would get coverage, too. Then there would be, you know, he doesn't really mean it. You know, it would be a whole like about four news cycles. At, you know, he'd say this thing about the blood of our country and it would get him so much free media. So I think there are two things happening here. What I think uh, Essie was saying is right that he knows that the people who really will go for him are those George Wallace types, the kind of people for whom, you know, they've never had a mainstream politician, or at least not for a long time, saying the quiet part out loud like this. And so they're very galvanized by it because they truly do believe in this kind of horrendous rhetoric. And then I think the other is that he's just trying to get those outrage news cycles going again because he rode them to victory in 2016. Now, I'm not sure it would, even if he could get them going, they would work for him now because he's been doing this for so long. But I do think that's inadvertent or advertent his goal. Yeah, I guess, Essie, the question I have, though, is how does this help Donald Trump win in places like the suburbs of uh, Philadelphia caucuses next month? It was kind of interesting to hear Ron DeSantis say this. Let's listen to it. If Trump loses, he will say it's stolen no matter what. Absolutely. He will, he will, he will try to delegitimize the results. Uh, he did that against Ted Cruz in 2016, um, and he will do that. I mean, even when, like, 
the apprentice didn't get an Emmy, he said. <laughs> he said so, so I think I don't think there's been a single time he's ever been in competition for something where he didn't get it, where he has, where he's accepted. I don't think he will do that. So I think he's doing that. Um, I think that that's to be expected. But I don't think people are going to buy it. Right. I feel I I'm less confident in this because he's run such a horrible campaign. But the my my original thoughts on DeSantis were he's he's Trump, but less stupid, and so therefore. If he gets in the office, he'll more effectively implement the evil program. There'll be less mistakes made. You know, Trump, we were blessed in a sense that he's such an idiot because when he did evil, he did it so badly that the courts overturned it or he couldn't get Republicans, even the cult on board enough to get over the filibuster and all these sorts of things. Right. Um, so the reality is right now, like Ron's right. Trump's going to deny it no matter what, and he's going to be a fascist monster no matter what. But this is what people have noticed. They're trying to make it look like a big full arena, but it's absolutely positively, you know, the, the cavernous in there. And this is in New Hampshire. They don't have giant arenas in the state already. Again, Trump does this on, on purpose. He used to have rallies in like NBA stadiums, NHL stadiums, football stadiums, baseball stadiums. He used to do that and fill them. I hate the guy, but he used to draw massive crowds. And now he picks small venues and can't even fill those. It's the one silver lining tonight is that the, the cult is bored of the fascism. We can only hope that they're too bored to come, come and vote for this SOB. God forbid if he's not in prison in by November of next year.